September 7, 1861, was a Saturday night that would forever change the Markham family. It was on this night that the family was placed squarely in the crosshairs of the lawlessness that prevailed across the region as war raged between the states. This is the story of a 16-year-old Civil War heroine who took on a Confederate soldier with an axe, lost an eye, and lived to tell the story. Hey y'all, I'm Christina and you're listening to History and Hearsay. I hope that if you enjoyed today's story, you will consider subscribing. Julia Ann Markham was born November 7th, 1844 to her parents, Hiram Markham and Primella Huff Markham. After their marriage, Julia's parents moved to Scotts County and started a small farm on Buffalo's Creek, which was about four miles east of Huntsville. They had five children, four daughters and one son. Later in life, Julia would write a short autobiography biography and she wrote that her father was a farmer, lived on his farm, made a living, and was a happy law-abiding Christian man and also his family. She wrote that he stood for the flag, the freedom of America and its perfect laws. And it was standing for the flag that would place the Markham family in the middle of the fight during the Civil War. There were no major battles fought in Scott County, though there were several minor scrimmages, including the Battle of Huntsville and the Battle for the bacon. Instead, the war visited Scott County primarily in the form of lawlessness. Guerrilla warfare was common and soldiers on both sides of the fight routinely raided homesteads throughout the isolated Cumberland Plateau settlements in search of supplies. Some historical accounts of that fateful Saturday night in September 1861, including some written by major newspapers, leave the impression that Hiram Markham and his family stood alone as Union sympathizers, which left them at odd with their neighbors in the Confederate South. That, however, is not true. The Markham family wasn't alone in their loyalty to the Union. Most of the residents of Scott County rejected secession, and the sentiments of the Markham family were the sentiments of most everyone there. The loyalty to the Union was also held in neighboring counties such as Fentress County and Morgan County. Earlier in 1861, Scott County joined the the rest of East Tennessee in twice voting against secession. The first time, Tennessee narrowly rejected the call to leave the Union and join the Confederate States of America. But Isom Harris, who was the governor of Tennessee at that time, had risen to political power in the 1850s as the leader of the Southern Rights wing of the Democratic Party. And as such, he advocated the right to hold property in slaves. He was fiercely opposed to President Abraham Lincoln, the newly formed Republican Party, party and their calls to abolish slavery. There were many in Tennessee during this time who remained loyal to the Union and the general sentiment for people in that area was that Governor Harris used his political influence and constitutional power to trample on the state constitution in order to align Tennessee with the Confederacy. While much of East Tennessee was opposed to secession, Scott County was especially against leaving the unions. Voters there had actually listened to an impassioned speech by future President Andrew Johnson that he had given on the steps of Scott County Courthouse. And after that speech, they had turned out to vote against secession by the largest margin of any county in the state, 541 to 19. So as you guys can see, Scotts County was very much opposed to secession and very much filled with Union loyalists. And so the Markham family really was not alone in these sentiments. By the second vote, however, the Battle of Fort Sumter had occurred. President Lincoln was calling for volunteers to squash the rebellion and the mood was changing. While West Tennessee had voted in favor of secession months earlier, Middle Tennessee broke for the Confederacy the second time around and Tennessee officially seceded. When President Abraham Lincoln called for troops after the fall of Fort Sumter in April 1861, Harris answered that Tennessee would not furnish a single man for the purpose of coercion, but 50,000 if necessary for the defense of our rights and those of our Southern brothers. He then turned over 100,000 Tennessee troops 
to the Confederate government. This earned him the title, the War Governor of Tennessee. When news reached back to Huntsville that Tennessee had seceded and joined the Confederacy, many angry citizens who had voted against secession held a special meeting at the courthouse. They were so upset by this decision that they wanted to leave Tennessee altogether. Everybody was all like breaking up with everyone else at this point. Things were just getting completely out of hand, as you guys probably know. And one old farmer was reported to have been in the meeting. He jumped to his feet and he said, if the state of Tennessee can secede from the Union, Scott County can secede from Tennessee. I think we all like to romanticize the olden days and think that people back then didn't use bad words, but they did. So everyone agreed with this old farmer and they decided that their county was just going to break up with the state. If the state could break up with the country, then the county could break up with the state, right? So the county court voted to pass a resolution declaring itself the free and independent state of Scott. And the sheriff was dispatched to Nashville with a letter proclaiming Scott County's independence. I'm not really sure how they thought this was going to work because it's Not like the county could physically remove itself from the state. I mean, it's like getting a divorce, but continuing to live together. Like, we aren't married anymore, but I'm going to keep living here. I just don't see how that could possibly work. Regardless, I do have to commend them for their bravery. I mean, that takes some major cojones. And these guys had it. Governor Harris, however, was definitely not impressed. And so he ordered troops to go to Scotts County on orders to capture and hang all members of county court. Luckily for them, none of them were ever apprehended, but Scott County was under Confederate control until 1862. In the early days of the war, when sides were still being chosen, when almost everyone in Scott's County had voted against secession, many chose to take up arms by slipping across the border into Kentucky and signing up with the Union Army there. The Markham family, however, took it a step further and they decided they were going to stay put and boldly give aid to Union sympathizers. Much of Scotts County was opposed to secession, as we've mentioned multiple times, but the reason behind it was simply because they really just wanted to be left alone. The settlements along that area were established primarily by farmers, and there were fewer slaves owned in Scott County than in any other county in Tennessee. And it was said that the abolishment of slavery, one of the big issues that loomed as a contributing factor to secession and the war, wasn't really a big deal to them there. It just didn't affect their everyday life in the same way that it did certain individuals in other parts of the country. Lincoln was elected in 1860 as the first presidential nominee of the Republican Party. At this time, the Republican Party was a brand new political party and had been founded on a commitment to stopping the expansion of slavery. But there wasn't much Lincoln enthusiasm in Scotts County and it was said that he actually only received one vote there. Shade Lou Allen. He was the only person who cast a vote for Lincoln in that election. So while it was said that most people in Scotts County really didn't see slavery as a big issue, Hiram Markham's decision to stay put and help Union sympathizers was because of his opposition to slavery. When speaking of her father, Julia wrote that Hiram Markham was for freedom of our nations and its liberties for the people. Father stood for the union and its principles. And it wasn't just Scott Countyans who were slipping across the border to fight for the union. Many pro-union men and teenagers all over Tennessee were taking their rifles and heading to Kentucky. And as they passed through Scott County and towards the Cumberland River, Hiram Markham gave them shelter and aid as they happened by his Buffalo Creek farm. And Hiram was obviously making a pretty big impact because by the fall of 1861, the growing Confederate army in East Tennessee had had enough. The Confederate leader for that area, Zola Koffer, had first tried a gentle approach by attempting to persuade people in East Tennessee to stop resisting the Confederacy. But by that fall, Governor Harris had called up 4,000 more troops 
troops in Knoxville and had passed along orders to Zola Koffer to stop the resistance at all costs. He was given instructions to banish Union sympathizers from their homes and from East Tennessee completely if necessary. It didn't take long for word to reach the Markham farm that Hiram was now considered an enemy of the Confederacy. Their rendering of aid to people who were headed north to join the Union Army hadn't gone unnoticed and there was now a price on Markham's head, figuratively at least. Julia wrote, the rebels invading our county, as there were but few rebels in the county, they sent their armies here to kill and destroy our men, women, and property. With all this going on, Hiram was afraid that the rebels would invade his farm in the middle of the night, so he had taken to hiding in the woods and in the barn and just anywhere that was away from the house so that he wouldn't be a sitting duck if they decided on like a surprise visit. Confederates had been showing up day and night to look for harem but on that particular Saturday night the 7th of September three dozen confederate soldiers showed up at the farm at two o'clock in the morning with bayonets fixed on their rifles they burst through the door of the Markham home demanding to know where harem was Hiram I've probably been saying his name wrong this whole time Julia wrote that there were 36 men who had come to kill her father and that they were threatening they would kill all the women and burn us all in the house. We began to holler and scream for help. As the men spread out across the farm to look for Hiram, he stayed hidden because he knew that he would likely have been shot, arrested, or hanged on sight if any of the soldiers were to discover his hiding place. So while the other 35 soldiers kind of just looked all around the farm, one soldier stayed behind in the house, I guess just threatening the women and keeping them in line. But then whenever Julia's sister died, Dama, she lit a piece of a tallow candle so that they could see because it was getting dark. And the soldier began choking their mother, Permella, and so Didyma raced upstairs and one of the soldiers went chasing after her. He grabbed her and was just yelling at her that he was going to cut her throat and set the house on fire. Not really sure this story seems to be missing a piece. But Didyma, of course, starts screaming and their father, Hiram, comes running out of the barn where he'd been hiding. You know, he hears his daughter screaming and so he couldn't stay hidden any longer. He didn't really care at this point. He had to save his daughter. He broke into a run, headed for the house. I mean, I'm sure he just felt like it wasn't worth staying hidden if they were going to do something to his family, which is kind of surprising they didn't consider doing something like that before, but he runs into the house to save his daughters. So Julia says that there were no guns in their house, but they had two axes. And Julia and her sister Minerva both grab an axe in an attempt to save Di. Dama from the Confederate soldier. And in Julia's own words, she says, all weapons that we had in the house were two chopping axes. Minerva got one and I got the other. Two men ran from the door just as I started upstairs. Minerva threw her ax down. I went on up. He struck me with a bayonet on his gun. I ran under the gun and chopped him in the face and breast with the ax. Cut him to the hollow and split his chin open with the ax. Getting the best of him, I knocked his gun from his hands. He staggered around and around and said, don't chop me anymore. But I did not stop. He got hold of the gun and struck the bayonet in my forehead, burst my skull, knocked my brains out, put out my left eye and shot my third finger off of my right hand. Father came up the stairs just as the gun fell out of his hands. Father shot him in the shoulder. He fell dead. Once Hiram had come to the rescue, the rest of the Confederate soldiers fled the farm. Arm. <laughs> this whole story is a little bit odd to me because they had 36 guys and it was like a handful of teenagers the mom and the dad and these guys ran like so I don't, I don't really know you know there's a part of me that wonders if these guys really didn't want to get him because maybe they knew this family personally I always find that to be one of the most tragic parts of the civil war is that you know these were neighbor against neighbor brother against brother and it's really sad when people take up arms against their own countrymen. And sometimes when I hear stories like these where there seems to be a like a, a halfway attempt to like capture someone or attack someone and they just don't, it doesn't seem like they go all the way through. Like I almost wonder if it's done on purpose because they really don't want to hurt this person. It could have been someone they grew up with, you know? I just, I wonder about that sometimes. So anyway, the Confederate soldiers flee and Julia Markham, of course, at this point was unconscious. She had just been stabbed in the, like in the forehead. So she's obviously 
obviously extremely injured. So Hiram takes his daughter and lays her out on the bed and he realizes there's not much he could do for her. So he just takes the gun and he retreats from the home, returning to his hiding place before any of the soldiers were returned. And so he leaves the house not knowing how badly his daughter's injured, if she's going to live or die. So then Julia's 14-year-old brother, Claiborne, gets on the dead Confederate soldier's horse and rides all through the night, just going to various neighbors, trying to find someone who would help him until one neighbor and Mrs. Taylor offered assistance. And by this time, it's said to be daylight. And Mrs. Taylor actually goes to the nearby Confederate encampment and tells the commanding officer what had happened. So the officer, Captain George W. Gordon, visits the farm with a group of soldiers and then sends back to the camp for their doctors. The doctor comes and tends to her wound while the other soldiers carry the dead Confederate away and bury him. You see what I'm, you see what I'm saying here? Like they're told to squash rebellion at all cost, but they come in and help this girl. I mean, you know, it could be said that they're like, she's an innocent, she's a teenager, she shouldn't have been ever been like involved in this. So maybe there was some sympathy there, but you know, I always just wonder how many of these guys were really reluctantly fighting and you know, didn't really didn't want to be there. Julia writes in her autobiography that we were left in a terrible fix to the mercy of the rebels, but they went away. It was three months before Julia recovered enough that she was able to leave the house. But to me, it's miraculous that she recovered at all, but she did. And while the rebels went away, they didn't stay away. They continued to camp near the Markham farm. And Julia says they destroyed all we had. I'm guessing maybe they were destroying their crops. It doesn't really say in her letter, but that would kind of be my interpretation. So in January 1862, one of the Markham's cousin, George, he was already enlisted in the Union Army and he was trying to sneak up north to join with his company. Now he wasn't in uniform and he had been hiding out in the barn waiting for a chance to slip through the Confederate troops. And at this point, Julia, who was finally recovered enough from her injuries to get out of bed, she walks outside, she sees the the Confederates approaching the barn one morning, like they're sniffing around. Maybe they got wind that he was there. So she races in to warn George and one of the soldiers fired at her. He barely misses her, but she wrote the bullet was close enough to cut a lock of hair from my head. So this girl was very lucky. Somebody was watching over her or I feel like she just had nine lives or something like that. George, however, heard the commotion and he tried to escape from the barn, but he was shot as he fled. Julia pled with the men to leave the mortally wounded man alone and they threatened to kill her and her sisters but once again they eventually relented and they just left the girls alone allowed them to take their cousin into the house and he died a few hours later so they must have realized like he wasn't gonna make it and I guess we'll stop terrorizing these girls see again here we go with them just kind of like letting it go at this point the Markham family I guess they were worried that they had outlived their luck and and maybe it was time to go. So they packed up their belongings, whatever they had left that the Confederates hadn't destroyed, and they headed out through the snow for Kentucky. They eventually sought refuge in Casey County near the Green River, which is a ways northwest of Somerset. And they actually would never return as a family to their Buffalo Creek farm. Julia's father, Hiram, joined the Union Army and was attached to the 13th Cavalry of Tennessee. But just a little more than two years after they had fled from their farm in February 1864, Hiram got smallpox and died at the age of 51 years old. Hiram is buried in a military cemetery in Nashville. The rest of the Markham family later moved east to Pollock County to Flat Lake Creek, just southeast of Somerset. The Markhams weren't the only family who were driven out from their Cumberland Plateau homes during the Civil War. And by the war's end, guerrillas had driven out almost all the families from that region. In 1867, an adventurer by the name of John Murrer passed through the Cumberlands on his walk to the Gulf of Mexico. And he wrote, that most of the homes in the remote countryside had been abandoned. Although the war had ended, he still encountered bands of guerrillas hiding along the road. And he wrote, houses are far apart and uninhabited, orchards and fences in ruins. 
sad marks of war. Julia's mother, Permella, died in August 1865, just after the end of the war at the age of only 53, and she's buried at the Flat Lake Baptist Church. All of Julia's siblings survived the war and were able to all grow up and get married. Julia Markham returned to Tennessee after the war and was a school teacher for 12 years before her injuries eventually forced her to retire. She petitioned Congress for a Civil War pension, and it was eventually granted thanks in part to her sister Minerva's brother-in-law, who was a congressman. Julia was one of only a handful of women to be granted a Civil War pension, and she was the only woman in the U.S. granted a pension as a combatant in the war. So I think some women had money, like based on their husbands or their fathers, contributions, but she was the only one who did it basically for herself and like acknowledged that she had actually fought in the war. So she was initially granted $30 a month and that was later increased to $40 in 1922. Her pension would have only been worth about $620 a month in today's money. But even though that's not much money, Julia seemed to be grateful for it. And she wrote that I am the only woman in the United States that draws a pension without the aid of a soldier. No other one like unto it. It is glad tidings to me to be remembered. By 1926, when she wrote her short autobiography, all of Julia's brothers and sisters and their spouses had all passed away. I'm still here yet to enjoy the great blessings of life and God's love, she wrote. It was 10 years after writing that, 50 years after retiring from teaching, that Julia Ann Markham died of pneumonia in Williamsburg, Kentucky at the age of 91. She was buried in Highland Cemetery with military honors. She is believed to be the only woman ever recognized by the U.S. government as a combatant in the Civil War. Today, a plaque on the lawn of the Whitley County Courthouse in Williamsburg recognizes her as Aunt Julia Markham, which is what she became known after her years of teaching. And the plaque reads, she was the only woman admitted as a full member in the Grand Army of the Republic. The Markham family has to be one of the most amazing examples of standing up for what you believe in, despite incredible odds. To have your own country turn into basically enemy territory and to choose to stand up and help others for the cause, that's what I would call standing firm in your beliefs. This family really had the most incredible, inspiring faith and I hope you guys found their story as inspiring as I did. Leave me a comment down below and let me know what you thought of this one and don't forget to subscribe on your way out. Okay.